So we mentioned this when we first started talking about the Lewis model. The Lewis model is a very simple model. It really is an oversimplification. We have some theories that are much more advanced that apply the ideas of quantum mechanics to molecules. And so these modern quantitative methods um, accurately predict many properties of the molecules. Bond length, strength, geometry, dipole moments, all of these things. Um, but looking at those in their quantitative awesomeness is very involved. And so we're not going to look at them quantitatively. We're going to look at them, two of them, in a qualitative manner, just quality uh, without the numbers. So the first one is valence bond theory. Valence bond theory treats um, bonds as over, overlap of orbitals. So remember, we learned that electrons reside in quantum mechanical orbitals. Those are localized on individual atoms. So we've got the s orbitals and the p orbitals and the d, et cetera. These atomic orbitals can be hybridized. So what's a hybrid? A combination of two things. A hybrid vehicle can run on gasoline or electricity, right? A hybrid dog is two different breeds, right? So a hybrid orbital is two kinds of orbitals mashed together, sort of. And we'll talk about that. When two atoms come together, the electrons in the nucleus of one atom are going to interact with the electrons in the nucleus of the other atom. And so valence bond theory looks at how the energies, the energy changes that result when this happen, happens. A chemical bond is going to be formed if the energy is lowered by doing that. So here we have a graph with energy going up here. And the x-axis represents the distance between the two hydrogen atoms. So we've got two hydrogen atoms approaching each other. So here, they're just getting close enough to have some interaction. And so that interaction is causing their energy to lower a little bit. Lower is more stable. And as they get closer, we get lower energy. And closer yet, now their orbitals are overlapping, we have even lower energy. If you continue to push those two atoms together, though, the energy increases. It's, you know, it's like you and your, your good buddy, right? And so, you know, you're attracted to each other. You enjoy spending time together. But if you got squished too close together, that would be icky and you wouldn't like that, right? And you back up. There's personal space involved here. You like him over here, but you don't want him sitting in your lap, right? So personal space. But what's going on here is when these nuclei that have positive charges get too close together, they're going to repel each other. So there's this sweet spot where we maximize the attractions between the electrons of one atom and the nucleus of the other, and we minimize the repulsions of the two nuclei. This is a little bit like uh, a ball rolling down a hill. So you put a ball here, and it's going to roll down here, and it's maybe going to go up there a little bit, and it's going to settle here, the lowest energy. As these atoms approach each other, they're going to end up with this as the most stable place. Because it's the lowest energy, it's the most stable for them. We, we actually know what this distance is because we can measure the distance between the two nuclei. And, and that's what we call the bond length. The energy of that is the bond energy. If they get farther apart or they get closer together, the energy increases. The bond energy is the lowest energy. How does the um, bond length, so bond length changes? No, the bond length does not change. This is a hypothetical if we were bringing two atoms together. As we got them closer and closer, the energy would decrease. They'd become more and more stable until we reached a point of maximum stability. And then if you push them together further, they're going to become less stable. 
it's like a lot of things. There's extremes. The extremes aren't good. There's some nice place in the middle, the sweet spot, where it's the best. Any other questions? That interaction energy is usually negative, meaning it stabilizes. When you have those two atomic orbitals, um, each having one electron, so the electron from one hydrogen and the electron from the other hydrogen, they're going to overlap, and you're going to get a pair of electrons. They're going to, they're going to orient with opposing spin. So just like we saw in an individual atom, where if there's two electrons in an orbit, they spin pair, one up and one down, in this bond, this orbital overlap, the ideal thing is two electrons, one spin up and one spin down. Usually this results from um, two half-filled electron, I'm sorry, two half-filled orbitals. So like hydrogen atoms. Each hydrogen atom has one electron in the 1s orbital. That orbital is half full. The other hydrogen comes along with its half full 1s orbital, and now we can pair those two electrons up in this shared orbital overlap. But it doesn't have to be that way. There's something called a coordinate covalent bond, and this happens when you've got two electrons from a filled orbital overlapping with an empty orbital on another atom. Now this doesn't happen nearly as often, but it can happen. So you've got your two atoms with half-filled orbitals. They approach each other. The orbitals overlap, and the electrons align so that they have opposite spins. So if they both came in positive or both came in negative, one of them would flip, and they can do that. So this is a summary of what we've talked about so far. Valence electrons of atoms in a molecule reside in quantum mechanical orbitals. A chemical bond results from the overlap of two half-filled orbitals with spin pairing of the two valence electrons. And this, this meshes with Lewis theory, right? Because in Lewis theory, we were looking at electron, uh, atoms sharing electrons, right? And that shared pair, the bond, is two electrons. So here it's the two electrons are, are spin paired. The geometry of the overlapping orbitals is what determines the shape of the molecule. Any questions yet? Let's look at um, dihydrogen sulfide. H2S. So here we have orbital diagrams of the valence electrons for hydrogen, hydrogen, and sulfur. So sulfur has um, a total of six valence electrons, and there would be two in the 3s orbital, and then we have three 3p orbitals. One of them's full, and two of them are half full. So this half full orbital could overlap with the half filled orbital of the hydrogen. And these electrons can spin pair. This one will flip, or that one will flip. And so here we have the hydrogen overlapping with one of these p orbitals. So this is one p orbital, and we have another p orbital. That one's full. And then we've got this third p orbital, and that one is overlapping with this hydrogen. That makes sense? Yes? Uh, why do they prefer going to sulfur's p than over? over the two hydrogens sticking together? Um, that's a good question. Why are they going to form H2S instead of just plain sulfur and two you know, molecular hydrogen? Um, that would depend on reaction conditions, because that certainly could also happen. Any other questions? And then that full S orbital for sulfur is depicted here in the blue. So. This, though, predicts that this bond angle is 90 degrees, right? Because we have these p orbitals. The p orbitals are in the x, the y, and the z coordinates, right? They're at 90 degree angles to each other. That s orbital is not having anything to do with it. It's just sitting there. And so these would be 90 degrees. 
but we know that it's not 90 degrees. It's actually 92. And Vesper theory, all we can get from Vesper theory is it's less than 109.5. So Vesper theory would be okay with either of these in terms of actual bond angle. So, hmm, kind of wishy-washy on this. Pardon me? What molecular geometry? Yeah. Um, it would be bent. It would be bent. And, and that's, what, um, that's what Vesper theory predicts as well, if we draw that. We have the S with the hydrogens, and we've got two lone pairs, right? So four, four groups would be a tetrahedral electron geometry. And then the two lone pairs tell us the molecular geometry would be bent. And because there's two lone pairs here, we're going to say that bond angle isn't going to be 109.5 because that would be a perfect tetrahedron. It's going to be less than that. The lone pairs are more repulsive. Yeah. Let's look at a different example. Because that one was like, eh, maybe, maybe not. Is this another section? It is. I should stop.